Good morning, everyone. I'm really excited to be here, and I thank um, Bartram Trail Conference for choosing me for the Father Gill Award, which helped me, as I show you, be a modern day Bartram traveling to get samples for my project. So what we're gonna do is look at the survey, start with Bartram and uh, what happened in the past and where we're going today. So there is William Bartram. We've all been seeing him quite a bit. And his travels on the right, his time within Georgia and Florida and uh, North and South Carolina. And this is a map of what Georgia was like during the time that he traveled. And you could see the Ultima River right here, which is where he discovered Franklinia. And this is a map of his travels at that time. And a close-up of the Ultima River. And as you see in the red highlighted box, that's Fort Barrington, and it's near the Ultima River, and that is the area in which they found, or in which he found Franklinia. And at that point, it was like 13 acres. And by the time um, people came and investigated, one person called John Lyon, who was from Scotland and was a collector, they couldn't find it. And so there are some records that it was possibly seen in the wild, even to the mid um, 1840s. But today, nobody can find any remnant of it. And this is the Ultima River. And what's interesting with this, um, this is the Encyclopedia of um, Natural Sciences, and the date here, 1821, they still were calling it Gordonia pubescens. And that's what he first called it. He thought it was Gordonia. And then it, he had the name Gordonia franklinii, and other, um, I guess, naturalists kept writing Gordonia pubescens. So even though he ended up calling it Franklinia Latamaha, other people were calling it Gordonia pubescens. So we have a mystery. Where is Franklinia? What happened to it? Why don't we see it? And the, we know already that Bartram had brought seed to Philadelphia and planted it and distributed it. Now, what I'm hoping from the audience, from you scholars, is thinking about the trade routes. Did he at all give seed away as after he collected it and try and find out where it is? And I'm gonna show you what happened with, I uh, assessed the genetics that um, it got taken to different places, but we don't know, was it a piece of a plant after he grew it, a cutting, because it roots real easy? Was it seed? Was it seed from a tree that he grew? And so forth, you can see that it got spread around, but we don't know exactly how. But genetically, we can see where it ended up. So my objectives for this part of my PhD, looking at genetic diversity, and I wanted to know, okay, in this population in the beginning, was there enough genetic diversity or not to keep it alive in case something happened, some type of disease came in or flooding? And 
or also was it a clone, just one plant genetically? Because it can root real easy, the limbs drop down, and they can layer and put roots down. So we don't know. And the other thing is if there isn't any genetic diversity, then we need to introduce some. And that would be there's modern techniques using chemicals, mutagens, and um, gamma radiation. And so that's one thing that I've tried, which I'll talk to you about soon. And then another thing that I worked on was developing a micropropagation system from tissue culture. And that's helping us, if we find the genetic diversity, to be able to cryopreserve for the future and also to be able to plant it out back into the wild and to get it out where people can enjoy it and have it in their yard and have it live and like a monument to William Bartram. So with my genetic diversity analysis, I had to collect seed or leaves. And then I had to isolate the DNA. And the procedure I was going to use is called genotype by sequencing. How many of you know about 23andMe? <laughs> okay, everybody? <laughs> All right. Well, basically, I'm doing this. And we're going to find out the DNA profile of each of the samples that I collected and compare them from one to the other. And so that's how this acronym, genotype by sequencing. So I'm doing 23andMe on all the leaves. And so after I get the DNA sequencing data, I'm going to do um, use the software analysis. The whole procedure is called bioinformatics. And you take that sequence and you use this complicated software. And it can take weeks, it can take months before you actually get that data and you need a supercomputer. Um, I didn't even know we had one on campus <laughs> until it came about that we had to do this. And so what I wanted to show you here is this is the different material. We have, oops, okay, we have um, up there the leaves, seeds, and of course um, getting seeds from seed pods directly. So this is my Bartram's Adventure, modern day, 2018, and actually some started 2017. So I collected samples. I wish it was all in person, but unfortunately, I couldn't afford it as a graduate student. <laughs> so I made lots of contacts and wonderful people through this journey. And so I have from Canada up here, of course, North America, Europe, and New Zealand. And those were, I put out word on this um, biodiversity website that tells you how many gardens and uh, arboretums have Franklinia. And there were about 99. But then when I started calling them up or emailing them, they're like, oh, ours died. Oh, ours only has two leaves. We don't want to spare. Um, it was really tragic. It was like I kept hearing how many had died, and they had them only for a certain amount of time. And they were extremely sad about it, believe me. These people, they valued it very much. Um, so here's the ones from Europe I had from the Royal Botanical Garden in Edinburgh, from the Royal Botanical Garden in Wakehurst, Kew, um, Boss Coop, Netherlands, a nursery, very small one. Um, West Pilar, Arboretum in Belgium. 
the Botanical Garden in Frankfurt and an arboretum at this uh, University of Warsaw. And then from New Zealand in Raglan, I was able to, whoops, I don't know why. Oh, okay. Um, so up here, it was a nursery called um, P, uh, Pete, or Peter uh, Cave Nursery. And he travels all the world. I mean, the Amazon. When I was trying to get samples from him, he told me, well, I'll be back when I come back from the Amazon. You know, I'll get some cuttings for you and send them. And so he, because of him being on the other side of the world, he sent me cuttings, which I put in water, and then the buds expanded, and I was able to get fresh leaves. Where everybody else, I was able to get either leaves or seeds. Now, these are the ones from um, the United States. And there's so many to list, but what I want to point out is we've got Kentucky, D.C., Connecticut, Georgia, Massachusetts, New Jersey, Alabama, North Carolina, New York, Ohio, and Massachusetts. So that's quite a few people that have donated leaves. And so the main ones that I got and you would think so, would be from Pennsylvania because Bartram brought it back to Pennsylvania, so there would be a good source. And these are the different places that I was able, how many people are from Pennsylvania other than <laughs> Joel? <laughs> okay, Joel is the one who helped me. He gave me a list. And there's this gentleman called Rick Ray who basically, we were on the cell phone constantly. He even helped me with my GPS in my car <laughs> to find all these places. And he called people ahead of time so that when I got there, like at Longwood Gardens, I had people take me to the different trees. So I brought my little bags with silica, and I even had them pick leaves for me. And so it was a partnership which was wonderful. And so you'll see um, I have some from a tree in Philadelphia that's over 100 years old, and some from Scott Arboretum in Swarthmore, and some homes in Media, Pennsylvania, <coughs> and uh, Tyler Arboretum in Lima, and of course Longwood Gardens, and then Concord's <laughs> Friends Meeting, Quakers, on their uh, meeting house, the grounds, they had three Franklinia, West Town School, and Morris Arboretum. So you can see a lot of people contributed, and they're all a part of this. So the first thing I had to do was isolate DNA from the leaves. So what I wanted was new, young, um, actively growing tissue because it's because it's the most actively dividing there's going to be a lot more DNA so I want to isolate as much DNA as I can from these cells and the older they are then they're already determined they're not um, they're not young and producing more and more DNA. So they're already finished with development. And so I had the mature, and then I had herbarium samples. This one is from 1957. So if I count from last year, when I got the sample, that's 61 years old, and it's from California. This one to your right is, anybody want to guess how old? 177 years old. Now, that one has an interesting um, whoops, history 
and it's called Gordonia pubescens here. Now, some of the writing on there, and that was the original writing on the mount, but there's also um, kind of like a, an imprint that it came from a college in Glasgow. And then it ended up at the U.S. National Arboretum, and then it went back to Edinburgh. So um, it's had quite an adventure, too. And before I go on, I just want you to know that when I did my literature search, there were very few papers that were able to get, um, people were able to get good DNA from herbarium samples. Most of the time it's degraded. And one, to get it to be able to get good sequence from, to get information, the oldest was maybe about 35 years old. I've got one twice that age, and then, of course, the 177-year-old specimen. Oh, the other thing I want to say is I asked the Museum of Natural History in London. They have one that Bartram pressed himself, 1788. You would not believe the red tape I would have to go through to get it. And they wanted to know if I could do this procedure that I said I'm going to do, and would it be successful? Well, I've never done it. I had no clue. And at that time, I had isolated the DNA and got good quality DNA from that specimen, and I let them know that. But they didn't want to spare. Um, and I understand completely, because I couldn't promise that anything would come of it. It's just that that would be the baseline. You know, Bartram himself, it's either from the seed you know, that he, the tree that he planted um, from that, because if you base the time, he got back in 77. This mounting was uh, 1788. So it's probably from a tree that he got the seed and planted and then took the specimen from. But I got turned down, so that's okay. I got some really good information, you'll see. So what we have to do is extract the DNA. So on the left, you can see these tubes. They've got steel beads in them. And what they're going to do, I'm going to take those, plunge them into liquid nitrogen, use this machine on the right called the tissueizer, and it just grinds them, shakes them really hard into a powder. Then I use this DNA kit made for, it's called HP, high performance, and you're able through these solutions and procedures to get DNA from the leaf sample. Then I need to find out, in order to do the GBS, you need a high quantity and high quality DNA. So um, this is one way to measure, is on this machine called the Nanodrop. And just to let you know, a lot of the stuff's super expensive, high tech. <laughs> and this is the kind of thing that you'll get. This graph. Um, let's see. Thanks. Well, anyway, these graphs right here show you a good peak. If you get a graph to look like that, that means your DNA is great, and it's based on a calculation. Um, using uh, or absorbance, the ratio of protein to DNA. And if that's where it needs to be, that's the graph you'll get. On the far right where you see the green is the quantification. How many nanograms per microliter, which is a very, very small amount. So most of these were really, really uh, good. And here's a close up. So here's the procedure of GBS, genotype by sequencing. And we first isolate the genomic DNA. You can see here on the bottom this gel. And the DNA is visualized using um, a type of chemical that 
gets in between the base pairs of the DNA, and you can visualize it. And then I'm going to take that DNA and use these enzymes that chew it up at particular sequences. So I'm going to make small pieces. Then I'm going to attach these barcodes to each cut up piece for each sample. So the barcode is basically unique sequences. So um, that way, every individual has their own barcode. All the pieces will have that same barcode for that individual. And then PCR, which you've, CSI, everybody's heard about PCR. Okay, we're just going to amplify those sequences because I need to have lots of pieces. And so then they'll all be pulled together, and then they're going to be sequenced on that machine to the right, which is called alumna sequencing. These things are like $500,000, these machines. But they have handheld sequencing machines now that you can do massive amount of sequencing, where it took 10 years for the human genome to be sequenced. You can have this sequenced in a couple days, or even in a day. So after you do the sequencing, you get an output of all of the base pairs of the DNA for each individual. And then you use that bioinformatics software and do statistics. And you're looking at each individual comparing each base pair or sequence to identify who varies from one to the next. Whoops. All right, don't freak out. <laughs> this is a, oh, I just lost the thing there. Anyway, um, this is what you call structure analysis. So we're looking at how many populations are there. So how many colors do you see? Two, right? Blue and red. So along the bottom axis, axis, the X, those are all 96 samples. So from those various places I collected, that is one from each of those different places. And if it's all red, completely, then genetically, it's distinct from the one that's all blue. So if you look in the middle section, you'll just see all blue. Now, this side over here, you have mostly red, but some DNA comes from the blue. And back over there, you have to the right, uh, mostly blue with some red. So here, this is a representation of it. this statistic or equation um, derived way to look at population and how much is attributed, um, looking at variation and how much we can account for that variation. And so you can see the blue population and the red, but there's overlap. So do you remember I had some that had some red and some blue? Well, that's what that is right there. So they share sequences that came from the blue population and the red to some degree or higher. Now, this is what you call a phylogenetic tree. Does that look scary? Okay. <laughs> it was scary when I first was looking at this. Um, it's basically a family tree. So what I'm looking at is how this is all my samples. How closely are they related to each other by <clears throat> DNA sequence? Uh-oh. <laughs> i got to hurry. Um, all right. So the top one is that herbarium sample from 177 years old. It is closely related to one from Bartram's Garden that I got in 2006. Also to one in Alabama, to one in Georgia, almost like completely identical, and one to Kentucky. And then what's interesting here, you'll see two in blue, 
They're from British Columbia, the university. Two of them are in one population. The other is in the red population. And then these ones, see how long they are compared to the other ones that are shorter? These are the most distant genetically from the rest of them. And some of those are from Bartram's, the car garden, and uh, the U.S. Botanical Garden, Poland, the Royal Botanical Garden in Edinburgh, and um, the Historical Society in Highlands, North Carolina. So in terms of the statistics, what we're going to look at first is when you get your genes from your parents, you have one type, or if you look at the gene, one sequence basically from mom and one from dad. If they're identical, they're called homozygous. If they vary, they're called heterozygous. So HO is homozygous. That means 60% of these are similar or the same, and 40% differ. The more heterozygosity that you have, the more genetic diversity you have. And then this is the amount of vari FST, the amount of variation that is explained between your populations and then within. So right now this is between, and there's very little, 10%, variation between the two populations. And you saw the overlap with those circles. And so 90% is within the populations. And then this last one is in breeding. So that's how much does it, a plant breed with itself, selfing or crossing out. And it, the more negative it is, the more it crosses out. So it pollinates with other trees, not itself. It doesn't favor that unless it's in an environment where there's nobody else to pollinate with. So in conclusion, um, basically we were able to isolate DNA from 177 years old and 61-year-old herbarium samples. And they provided reliable DNA. And we found that... Um, we have two genetically distinct populations and that there's more variation within each population than there is between the populations. And that's good news for us because that means we have genetic diversity that we can tap into to do breeding. And one of the problems with Franklinia, some of you know from the South, you can't grow it in the soil because there's an organism that was spread throughout the southeast through plant cultivation called Phytophthora cinnamomi. And so for the future, I want to use this genetic diversity and some um, mutational breeding to be able to get Phytophthora resistance. And that's another project I'm working on. And I mentioned to do the tissue culture. So if I get one that's resistant, I can propagate it, and I can also put it in cryopreservation for the future. This is what Phytophthora does. Pretty bad, huh? Look at the roots. It's devastating. It can happen in days, weeks, months, or years. It just depends how much is in the soil. This is what I use, gamma radiation. Remember the Hulk? Okay, he got gamma radiated. Well, my scenes don't turn green, though. And so I basically germinated seeds that had been um, irradiated over at our isotope lab on campus. And then, um, so now they're in a study where I've inoculated them with the Phytophthora, and I'm waiting to see who survives. So that's going right now. This is the tissue culture propagation um, that I worked on over the last couple of years. 
I take immature fruit and I got some from Joel and basically dissect out the immature seed and the embryo. Up here in A, you can see the little buds developing. It's called organogenesis, so the formation of organs, in this case, buds. I'm able to get them to elongate in B, multiply in C, multiply further and elongate in D, have them root in E, in F, be able to transfer them to soil, and then plant them in the greenhouse, and they flower. And they're beautiful, and there's variation among... Tissue culture can provide variation also, which would be good for breeding. But I have some variation in the flowering of the different ones that uh, came from different fruit. So I want to acknowledge Joel and my visit with him in Philadelphia that the Father Gill Award helped me get there. And... Dr. Dorinda Dalmeyer, who gave me her Sky Miles. <laughs> so, um, so, thank God. It was hard to get funding. I was trying with the grad school and being a full-time person. Uh, you get left out of a lot of things. Okay, You need to be like a full-time grad student to get grad student funding. So I had friends um, help me out. So um, Scott Wade, to the right there from Longwood Gardens, he went to a lot of parks and houses and raided people's trees with <laughs> leaves. And so Jack Johnston, who is a Bartram in Georgia, um, you all, and the Georgia Genomics Bioinformatics Corps who read the DNA, and Lav, my fellow grad student who did all the analysis, he's a whiz, smart guy. And my advisors, Dr. Dayton Wild, Scott Merkel, our greenhouse manager, oh my God, you wouldn't believe how much plant care she's had to do to keep all these alive and looking good. And the Merkel lab people, the... Um, lab people down the hall, um, Valeri. And these are, it's kind of like the credits of the movie that we saw last night. <laughs> I hope I've got everybody, I'm not sure. But these are all the people I talked to at all these organizations. And what I want to say, remember that herbarium sample, 177 years old? Okay, there is a tree in Cave Hill Cemetery do you know who's buried in Cave Hill Cemetery? Two famous people. Colonel Sanders, <laughs> above, Muhammad Ali. So there's probably some older ones, but um, those are the ones I know about. And so in there is a tree that's over 50 years old. And I've been trying through Udell um, Gardens to get information from the curator there to know where it came from since it's genetically identical to that herbarium sample that's 177 years old. And this is the tree on 42nd and spruce. It's over 100 years old, right, Joel? See how gravestones hold, holding it up, helping it? So Rick Ray told me, he goes, it's help from below, <laughs> or help from beyond, <laughs> help from beyond. So that's it. And I thank you all for your attention and support. Okay, you saw the Sherlock Holmes, right? That is, if we could go back in time. But because there's two populations in the cultivated uh, collection now, it's most likely that there were two in the original. 
And it could be he picked from two trees close by or a couple acres away. Um, he had to have sampled from both populations. And how much he sampled, I don't know if anybody has records. Also, when we were talking about the trading routes, is did he give some away along the way? And maybe that's where the Kentucky one, the cemetery, you know, this is an ancestor of it. Um, you know, it's also some of them, you know, are related to ones in Poland. There, the other thing that is not clear is there were some people that went back to the site and saw maybe a couple acres, but I don't know if they collected and brought it back to Europe. So they could have collected from maybe population one or from population two or both. But this is the artificial um, population by trade is what we have here, the two populations. So it's all man-made how it got mixed up. And it would be nice to know if anybody has any ideas, you know, that... Tracing it is going to be hard, but at least we know who's closely related. And um, we know that it also wasn't a clone of itself. So we can rule that out. Oh, I'm sorry. I, one question. I thought that you kept saying he, he, he. I thought right now was found by John and William under 1765. Yes. But there was no seed, and it was in the fall, and they just saw the red foliage. So they hadn't seen the flowers. And so 10 years later, if you read in Travels, it was in full bloom. And there happened to be fruit still on the trees. So the Franklinia will flower, at least in Georgia, but I think also up in Pennsylvania, um, usually August, September. And then it'll be pollinated at that time. And then in the spring, it starts growing and maturing. And by the next October, November, the seeds mature and they'll dehiss. So it'll take about a year. So, you know, he went back, let's say, more or less eight to 10 years later by that time. There was, and you can have a good year of pollination or a bad year. Um, you know, it's hard to say, but at least there were capsules. Otherwise, we wouldn't have this tree. You know, I just ask a quick question about, I was fascinated about the rattlesnakes because I confess I've always thought of them as more southern and western species. Yeah. Were they historically found um, throughout New England and into Canada? Yeah, and they were quite populous, especially in New England. And so, but I, I think a lot of people who live in New England don't even know that. So, that's been something really surprising. So you're saying they're extinct now in two states, and all the other, the other four, they're endangered. endangered. Yeah, and then there are a variety of other states too, kind of in the more the areas you'd expect where they're listed as endangered too. So, and there's one population in New Hampshire. And I'm trying to find someone to take me to it. But the problem is, you know, they really try to police who has access with, yeah. you know, understandably. I understand or have been led to believe that rattlesnakes are immune to each other's venom. Uh, and uh, also that the male rattlesnakes, when they're competing for the attention of a female, will, will not bother to bite each other because of that. Huh. Any comment on that? I don't, I don't know the actual kind of status of the scientific evidence today. There are a lot of debates in the 18th century about whether they can invent them themselves. Um, or, for example, their, their heads are still active after they've been decapitated. So that was kind of another sort of question. But I'm not actually, that's something I should look into because that would be really informative for the kind of how the kinship structures are working. But offhand, I don't know the answer. I have a question for both of them. Well, finished on. Yeah. <laughs> How did each of you come to have an interest in such a specific <laughs> 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 
All right, so my book project is, each chapter is devoted to the history of a different animal, and so I have corals, rattlesnakes, fish, and raccoons right now, and they all sort of have a different story of how I um, ended up looking at them, but rattlesnakes was really the one where I was just looking through the early American writings, and it was everywhere, and it was, it was the type of subject where, you know, whereas people are sort of just turning their eyes to corals, and that's just becoming a hot topic in the sort of historical studies people have sort of written about rattlesnakes to death, and I think sometimes those are the most interesting topics to look at something that seems like it's been completely done and to kind of find a, a new angle of, of research. So, so yeah, I just found them everywhere and was intrigued and was fascinated. Um, for me, I've always been into plants ever since I was wee little. And as time went on, you know, I've got my degrees in horticulture, so I've always been a plant lover. But I heard the story of Franklinia, and it happened that in the lab that I'm in now, there was a grad student working with Franklinia, developing a different type of propagation system. And so I asked my advisor, you know, can I work on it after he left? And it just got so much more interesting. And the more I read, and also my other background is plant genetics. And so I wanted to merge the things that I have skill in, the tissue culture for preservation, and being able to understand what the genetics was, you know, in the population. and what might have made it go extinct, and the fact that, you know, probably got bottlenecked by just a few plants being taken, or I mean, a few seeds. And so it's just the fascination and using my um, science background to dive farther. tell you what population those ones come from and also some of them are irradiated so they are being tested for phytophthora resistance so I have to look at my map to tell you but um, it's in the red it's in the red population but there's some blue genes <laughs> so <laughs>